I'm David S. Dawson from the Intellectual Podcast, a show that spotlights creatives from all walks of life, part of the Gunna Geek Network, just like the show you're checking out now. Shows on the network are individually owned, and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other incredibly geeky shows at GunnaGeekNetwork.com. Welcome to Play Comics, where once again, I am here talking to a creator with their cool stuff. This time, we have Patrick Kiki Jr. here talking about lots of cool stuff, because, Patrick, do you have a cool name for what we're talking about as a group? Uh, The Legacy Full Sexy Collection. I think we could call it that. That's not quite as exciting as I was expecting from you, but I did put you on the spot, so that's my fault. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um the super fun awesome full collection from legacy comics that'll work we're gonna roll with it it's literally something for everyone i am so excited for this because you have multiple books coming out and one of them i can take more than zero percent credit for bringing into existence well well, it's like i told you um you played your destiny card there um and you will get the first copy of that that comes off the shelf. That will be a Chris Osborne exclusive that I will sign and I will send, I will mail it to Carl Antonitz and uh, he'll send it over to you and uh, and you'll get it. So yeah, man, that's gonna be, uh, we're talking about Brooklyn Bleeds. Um, it's just a super fun zombie book that has a really crazy behind the scenes story that I don't know if I could talk about but I'm going to anyway because anyone that's listened to me on this show over the past couple years knows that sometimes I don't say the most popular things to some people but I always tell the truth so I'll probably be telling the truth a little bit today so yeah well let's go ahead and start with Brooklyn Bleeds because that's the first tab I have open naturally because it's Carl. Like, why would I not want to talk about Carl first? So good. He's so good. Um, so Brooklyn Bleeds originally started out as um, a Night of the Living Dead comic book. So I'm sure you guys um, know that like Night of the Living Dead has uh, moved into the public domain. And um, my former co-owner, John Svedesi, had approached me and was like, oh, we should we should do a Night of the Living Dead book. And I, I really wasn't interested in using a license that had gone into the public domain. For me, it's just like a cheap pop. It's like when a wrestler goes to like San Diego and is like, San Diego! It's like, of course they're going to cheer. It's like, why are we doing this? Um, and as many of you guys know, John is no longer with the company. Um... And at that point, this was kind of like, for me, this was a project that I felt like I was going to destroy the script. I was going to write a killer script. And if John wasn't able to deliver on the art, then um, we were going to figure out what to do in terms of him drawing. Because um, I wasn't terribly happy with the way Kroom had turned out. Um, It had gone through several drafts. while we were working on it and uh the end product was not up to my satisfaction hence why um it was originally supposed to have a print run of 550 and instead um we we decided to print only 200 because i felt like i wanted to just satisfy the kickstarter backers that ordered it um and then after that just sell it at at cons and i didn't want to I didn't think it was going to be a big seller on the site, and it hasn't been. It's done well at cons because little kids see it and they think it's cool and they want to pick it up. But I feel like that story has so much more potential. But anyway, um, 
Brooklyn Bleeds was originally supposed to be like a Night of the Living Dead, like Brooklyn edition. So, um, cause John had known somebody, he knows someone that's doing a Night of the Living Dead film, but obviously like anyone can do a Night of the Living Dead film because it's in, you know, public domain. So, but I was like, whatever. So I write this script and I'm like, tons of zombie books out there now. I'm like, we need to touch on something that hasn't been done before. Um, so I decided, let's do a zombie book based on how, like, the animals feel during a zombie apocalypse. Like, what if we do a book about a dog that basically watches his owner turn in the house and is stuck inside the house with his owner? And it's written in this instinctual monologue so it's like Homeward Bound without like Michael J. Fox. It's like Beast of Burden without any wit. And it's got like some Clementine in there. So I showed this to John and John liked it, but he didn't like the dog that I had picked. So I had picked the Chow Chow because um, they kind of look like lions a little bit. They're super loyal dogs. I had one when I was a kid. I wanted the whole book in black and white like Clementine, but I wanted like the dog's tongue because Chow Chows have this like purple tongue. I wanted like the tongue to be purple and the dog's like eyes to be in color and then obviously like the blood to be in color. So I had definitely like a look that I wanted to go for. Um, John had started some of the art on the book and then we that's when we had our, you know, falling out and he left the company. And um, I think within like a week or two, I had come to you and I was just like, if you know any good artists, send them my way. And uh, I told you like what Brooklyn Bleeds was all about. We're going really like behind the curtain now. We're getting a little granular here. But um, this is like the power of the Chris Osborne. And uh, Chris was like, boom, I got this guy. So I hit up Carl and um, it was funny. He ended up signing the contract while, while we were at ZoloCon. And uh, we, did, we did killer at ZoloCon. We sold a few hundred comics um in two days and it was it was really great and then carl signed and then carl um what had happened was john wanted the dog to be um something like a little bit smaller like an akita um and then like you know when john left the company i was like no we're going back to the chow chow and it worked out great because if you see the variant covers that um, Joshua Adams has done and Valentin Quinones, they nailed it. And then I told Carl, I'm like, do a spinoff of like the Okami like cover on the Wii. And he did an amazing job. And like today we have a little Facebook group chat called that, that I call the Legacy Lab. And it's basically all the writers and all the artists for Legacy. And we're just constantly shit talking and stuff. And um I told him, like, Carl sent me probably one of the most emotional pages that I've ever seen out of our company. And, like, it's, like, right on the same, like, level as some of the stuff in Sarita, you know, when Sarita's husband passes on and stuff like that. It just, it hits you super, super hard. So, this is a zombie tale, yes, but it's from the point of view of the super loyal, loving dog and how his whole entire life changes over the span of 24 pages and he has to become... He has to become a survivor, you know? Um, Carl does an amazing job bringing this comic to life. I'm super proud of the script. I knew that the script was solid, but I, I knew that I needed somebody special to pull it off. And this was kind of like, this was going to be like John's almost like last chance as an artist with, with us. Like if he wasn't able to pull this off or if his work wasn't up to par, he was going to move into another role with the company. And I'm so happy that like, John's happy now. He's doing some other stuff. I'm super happy for him. I'm super proud like that, you know, he's moved on and is doing great things. He's podcasting again. I wish him the best of luck. But like um just hooking up with Carl, thank you, Chris. Um has been amazing. Like this is going to be like one of those zombie books that like people are going to talk about for a long time because name another zombie book that takes place from like an animal's point of view. You know, it just doesn't exist. Um, and it's a lot of fun and it's barbaric and it's scary. So I'm, I'm super excited. So the thing is it's digital only. Um, however, um, we are releasing a series of trading cards this fall 
where the front of the trading card is the cover of the book and then the back is like a short synopsis and then a QR code that you scan and you can read the digital comic like wherever you want. So our print runs are usually like 550 comics. So we were gonna do a, originally we were gonna do a print run of 250 cards. Then um, we had brought Josh Morea back who did a really sexy variant cover of Legend of the Night Owl. Um, we brought him back to do a variant cover of uh, Brooklyn Bleeds, which isn't finished yet. It'll be finished soon. That's going to have its own run of 250 cards. So now you got 500 trading cards out. So then today, I'm breaking this news on the Play Comics podcast. Um, Joshua Adams, who is the artist on Sarita and the artist on Godfo and the artist on Dem Goals, he, his variant cover, which to me has gotten the best fan reaction out of everybody um just for that reason alone everyone has said that that's their favorite cover so he's gonna get a run of 250 trading cards as well so that comic is going to have a trading card run of 750 which is our biggest run of any comic yet so we're we're investing a lot in this comic so i'm super super excited for it carl is killing it the variant cover artists have killed it and it's just something different and it's a, it's around the perfect time it's right around halloween the end of the year people like scary stuff so mega excited for brooklyn bleeds and josh's cover is nice but it's no carl cover <laughs> i see your team carl see that's my favorite part too my alliances though that they're strong mm-hmm my, my team is, I love all three covers. The thing that I love the most, well, and, and it's going to be four covers because Josh Mariah is going to have a cover too. So it's just like, this is the first book that we've done that many covers for. And I just think it's fun, you know, and especially because it's digital. So it, it's not really costing us a ton of money. And plus it's like, it's kind of like the mission statement of our company to give artists opportunities that they normally wouldn't get anywhere so like valentin quinona is perfect example like he did our first variant the one for the job and um he's in the philippines super chill guy and um there's just some some guy that like the comic book industry doesn't know exists you know so i feel like it's our job as a company to give new and up-and-coming writers and artists an opportunity so it's no it's not a pain in the ass for us to have a couple of exclusive digital variants and then the investment in cards i feel like is going to be really cool and i mean we spoke about this before there's a universal paper shortage paper prices are ridiculous you're ordering comics from print ninja and print center usa and all these places um comics wellspring and they're they're taking anywhere from like four to six weeks to come um you order a trading card you can get it in like three or four business days you know, and a lot of people are into collecting stuff. So collect the card, get the card CGC slabbed. And that's the best thing. You get a card CGC graded, you can still scan it with your phone. You get a physical comic slabbed, you're never opening it ever again. It's stuck there forever, you know? So, um,. We're just trying to create as many opportunities for our stuff to be read. So, yeah, Brooklyn Bleeds is going to get a big trading card run. We're definitely going to see how it goes over with fans. It's going to be released, like, around the perfect time of the year. Yeah, that's it's going to be super special. And again, like, as the owner of the company, it's, like, impossible for me to say which cover I like the most. I'll just say that, like, Josh's has gotten some, uh, Joshua Adams' has gotten some really, really positive, um, reaction on social media but i love all four because all four are completely different from one another and it just shows our diversity artistically from a company point of view which is something i don't think it's not even that i don't think it's something i know we did not have in our kickstarter so we have that now putting my personal friendships aside with this like I would not be disappointed in any of these covers. Usually, no matter what the company yeah. is, there's always one that's like, I would really much rather have this cover than a different cover. And even taking mm -hmm. out the ones that are like, this randomly has my favorite character or it's randomly done by my favorite artist. 
Like, there's always one that I really want this one the most, and I really don't want this one over here. The three that I've seen, because you haven't showed me the fourth one yet, but I have mm -hmm. no doubt that the fourth one's going to be the same way. I'm not going to be disappointed if in any of these, if this is what my local shop had happened to pull for me kind of thing. I will tell you, and I'll break this for you, is that um, Josh is so funny. Like, Josh Mariah is amazing. Um, he's going to be at New York Comic Con. Um, he loves reference. So I sent him a ton of pictures of, like, chow chows and stuff. But he's like, he goes, I want to do something really cool and something really different. And I'm like, okay. And he's like, send me a picture of you and send me a picture of Carl. And I'm like, why? And he goes, you're going to be zombies in this. And I'm like, oh, my God. So that's going to be so much fun that like carl and i are going to be on the cover of a comic book carl doesn't even know so and i'm not going to tell him yeah it's going to be so much fun so just uh and like i said if you saw the variant for legend of the night owl josh does amazing work it's the picture of like you know afram doing that standing sidekick with his mother drinking the coffee in the background like he's so good so i'm excited to see where uh where that one goes so yeah, fall is going to be super important just because of the of us introducing the trading cards. But then, again, a book that has four different covers. So cool. So cool. Add something to my cart. We all knew it was going to happen. <laughs> Legend of the Night Owl. Like, I've got my Kickstarter copy. Mm -hmm. But is that going to stop me from getting a different physical copy? No. Not at all. <laughs> so that's the thing, too. Um, as of this recording, there's only two copies of that variant left. They're both in my man cave. They're both bagged and boarded. And they're just waiting to go home with somebody. Like they, Those were like a limited run of like 100 copies each. Um, the Legend of the Night Owl Zero variant by Josh Mariah. But... um. To go on to like Legend of the Night Owl 1, to me it's like I connected with this story because I just thought it was super cool. It's just like very 80s, 90s, Double Dragon, Streets of Rage style. Um, I went to school with Afram, I went to high school with him, so being able to like play a role in like his comic book dream coming true, super, super important to me. However, being a businessman and being an editor, um, Legend of the Night Owl Zero is a great start to the series, but in certain spaces, especially like the first page, I feel like that there's like entirely too much dialogue. I feel like Afram's trying to hit like all of those spots. Like he's trying to like really show people what a great writer he is. And in Night Owl 1, there isn't nearly as much writing. But I feel like he does such an amazing job hitting all of these spots. It's like the first issue, the zero issue, he was trying really hard and he succeeds. But in issue one of Night Owl, there's like this perfect blend of harmony between Kieran, Quinn, and Afram, just bouncing off of each other, words and text. And I feel like this is Afram's like best work to date. And it's nothing against Night Owl Zero, which I love, but Night Owl One hits so many different um points and then the thing is too for this round of comics we have a different letterer um john Svedesi did all the lettering for the kickstarter books and he did sarita but for this round of books it's joshua adams who does who did the art for sarita um and i don't want to shit on anybody but josh is a damn good letterer and i feel like he adds something he adds something extra that our books didn't have before. So I feel like the lettering, especially in Legend of the Night Owl, there's a couple of fight scenes where it's like, had the book been lettered by someone else, those little cues and little sound effects and little, you know, noises, those wouldn't have been in there. And it's just like Legend of the Night Owl 1, when I read it, I feel the same way I felt the first time I watched Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. When, like, the turtles are fighting, like, Rocksteady and Bebop before they've mutated. Like, that feeling in the alley when there's just, like, that, you know, you don't know what's going on, but you know there's a fight about to begin. And it's just, like, there's this, 
genuinely beautiful noir mystique in Legend of the Night Owl 1. And it's just because Kieran Quinn, again, kills it. His art, I mean, I'm not sure if you saw it, we announced the cover today, Kieran's cover for Night Owl 1. Um, Kieran's, uh, Kieran's cover for Night Owl 1 is going to be limited to just 200 copies. We're only doing 200 print copies. And there's a reason for that. And all I'll say is that like next week after Comic-Con, head to LegacyComics.com and you're going to find out exactly why. Um, it's going to be huge news. I just can't say anything yet. Um, but that's kind of like our, our A cover. There's going to be at least two other covers of that book. But like Kieran's cover is obviously like our A cover um and then we announced yesterday um or two days ago c fat who is a brooklyn artist he is going to do a variant that's going to be limited to 100 copies and it looks so like 1980s like nes style it's a lot of fun it's a really cool cover and this is a guy too which is i mean i told you chris this is my thing like publishing people for the first time i went on his instagram and i'm just like he's got this picture of dr doom that's really cool on his instagram and i'm just like oh this guy we could do something with this guy and he did a really fun cool cover for night owl one so we're like yep we're gonna publish that so now night owl is going to have at least three covers um and all three will be print and digital and the um kieran's cover will have a trading card run too so if you want to get kieran's cover in print and in trading card form you can do that as well but that i'm super happy now because like still when i do signings and stuff we're still selling kickstarter ash cans because we printed out like 550 of them so we still have some that we have to sell and um they're like sneak peeks they're like proof of concepts you know and it's hard to really hit somebody hard with an ash can which i feel i feel like the job um and legend of the night owl and dracula did a great job in their ash cans i feel like the other two um for various reasons didn't hit the marks that they that they needed to hit um but now that like the job and night owl both have full 24 page issues and you can kind of see the progress Oh, as as a business owner, as an editor, as a friend to these guys, to see like their visions like starting to like really come to life, super exciting time for us. So like, if you like Night Owl Zero, you will love Night Night Owl One. There's like no doubt to me. Like, this is some of Kieran Quinn's like best art ever. Like, if if you told me take like two or three of the best things that Kieran's ever did, like for Legacy, I would be like, take Conjury 3, Conjury 4, and Night Owl 1, and put those three things together, and like, he can hold his own with pretty much any indie artist in the business. So, Night Owl 1's gonna be a lot of fun too. I am so excited for that. I mean, people can go back and watch the video I made on all the Zero issues and what I thought on those, but knowing that all of these are getting their issue one, like I'm excited to see all of them. I, I just wanted to tell you too, I'm so thankful for people like you because I was in a terminal. Um, I think I was in a terminal, an airplane terminal in either Phoenix or Tennessee. And I was watching your video and it's just like, you were super diplomatic of the things that you didn't like, but I know you well enough. So I knew what you were trying to say and you were saying it. And then, then it's like, I presented your video to people that needed to see it and they dismissed it. And I said, that's the reason why my stuff feels a certain way and your stuff feels another way, you know? So just like in your own way, Chris Osborne, you have played such an instrumental role in this company because you're very I mean you're a lot nicer than me but like you say the things that like need to be said when they need to be said and that's how you grow you know so for me it's like I read a lot of books on like leadership <clears throat> and business and things like that and you know the former like head of General Electric every quarter 
he would cut the lowest 10% performing from his company. Even if they had like a record banner quarter, the lowest got to go, you know, and we've done that so far. We've cut a lot of the fat from this company. And um, I think when you cut the fat from a company, you force the people that are doing great work to like rise even higher. And I feel like that that's the case. I feel like I feel like people like Afrim and Kieran, they never got comfortable. Um, but then when they saw that like I was willing to like take a chance and go all in by myself, that they were going to rise to the occasion. And I feel like the work that I've gotten from Afrim, from Kieran, from Joshua Adams, from Steve Conjay over the past three months has been so much better than the work that I got from them before. And the work I got from them before was never bad, you know, but it's like... I was having a conversation with Steve Conjay like two days ago, and he's the artist from Renfield, Visions of Madness, and he's the artist that I picked to do the job one with me because I felt like Kieran was on three books. It's like way too much pressure for one artist, you know, like he was getting married, moving into a new place, and he's he's a super easygoing, mega mellow dude, and he totally would have done all three books. But I just feel like it wasn't fair to him. Like, you got to have a life, too. You know? So, Steve was sitting around, and, like, he had just done Dracula for us. And that was performing super well. So, and I was just like, you know what? Let's do the job. And, um, uh, two days ago, I went through the entire, all of the letters from the job one. And I literally almost cried. Because I was like, this book did not die after the Ashcan. Um, it has a future. It has an audience and then i mean we've done really good pre-order numbers for it too you know um and steve is a hustler steve pushes his books so it's just like that that's the thing that i want to just ex explain to some people if you read the job zero you're getting kieran's art and it's amazing and then in job one you're getting steve conjay who is very different from kieran kieran's like a david mack like watercolor kind of guy and Steve Conjay is totally like a digital artist, but it just works so good. Like it, it works so good. Like I was talking to the letterer like two nights ago, Josh, and I was like, be brutal. I'm like, be brutal. What, how do you feel about this comic? And um, in issue one, you get introduced to like Dan Dero's like adversary in the ring, you know? And uh, his name's the Poppy, that's his name. And uh, Josh is like, yo, the poppy is a scumbag. And I'm just like, yes, because that's exactly like what I wanted. I wanted it to be like Dan's this jobber and he's just trying to rise up. And the champion is just this complete jerk. And it's like, it's so much fun. And Bev has an expanded role, obviously. And we get to see more bank robbery. So it's just like, um, again, I'm all about like under promising and over delivering and it's just like taking kieran off of the job was probably one of the scariest decisions i ever had to make because it's like who wants to take like your best artist off of something but then it's just like that doesn't create an opportunity for somebody else to step in and steve i mean steve crushed it steve crushed it he and this is the thing too it's so hard anyone that's like thinking about starting their own comic book brand it's managing personalities like I am literally like the Dr. Phil to like 10 to 12 different people I know I know their wife's names I know their kids names I know what schools their kids go to I know like what they do for a living and stuff like that so it's just like you get really close to people but then at the same time too you have to keep them on task because comic books is totally deadline oriented and a lot of artists are about like the art and if it takes me a little bit longer then it takes me a little bit longer and as an editor as an owner you have to be like listen this isn't about like you doing the best work this is about you doing your absolute best but in the time that we have because if i give you six months of course you're going to do something great but i need it in a month or i need it in six weeks or i need it in eight weeks so the fact that steve was able to turn in what he turned in in the time that we gave him Oh my god, it says so much about him. So the thing is, like, if you like the art of Dracula, I feel, of uh, Renfield, Visions of Madness, I feel like it's not even a close comparison. Like, his stuff is so much better in the job. The palette that he uses in the job is so good. Um, there's a lot more Bev in um, the job one than, than there was in job zero. So just, like, there's... 
every character kind of like gets a place to shine and a lot of it is like the writing but a lot more of it is the art so steve like totally killed it in job one i'm super excited like the full just for if it was just the job and legend of the night owl coming out this fall i would be totally happy but then it's just like i already just ranted and raved about how much i love carl and and brooklyn bleed so it's just like we have three banger 24 page comics coming out this fall and then we still have other stuff coming out too so yeah sticking with the wrestling thing you've got the ballad of gia and frankie and first off before you start going on on that i have a feeling you guys like wrestling over there Oh yeah. Well, see, this is the thing. It's like I'm the voice of over 100 characters in WrestleQuest in a game that's coming out, you know, in next year from Skybound Games and uh, Mega Cat Studios. And those guys have been amazing to me. I mean, I've spoken at PAX East and PAX West this year with them. They've um, they've flown me out. Um, they took me to Ric Flair's last match in Tennessee. Um, I have four books in Harvard. And Yale and Stanford and stuff, and I cosplayed as the Macho Man Randy Savage of Pax West. Like that's how much I love these guys. Like I was actually like willing to do that and like just like yeah, whatever I got to do for the team. So it's just like I love professional wrestling. I have dynamite on right now in the other room. Um, so but what happened was um, this was another one of those stories where uh, I might get myself into trouble, but you know it's just like listen, you go on podcasts to like tell stories. So if you're not gonna tell stories, don't go on podcasts. Um, when we were doing the Kickstarter, I was in full on promo mode. I was hitting up every newspaper, every podcast, every single place that I possibly could. And looking back at it now, I feel like we could have done even more, but I was really like the only person that was doing that stuff, you know? And, um, I ended up getting us on local TV. Uh, in New York it's called News 12 and it basically plays in like all the five boroughs of New York City it reaches millions of people and I pitch them and I'm like our Kickstarter got funded in three and a half hours it's currently like you know it's six thousand dollars we were only asking for two thousand five hundred we have the I brought up the Bram Stoker thing and they they went nuts they featured us um I feel like it didn't do a lot for our Kickstarter because like we weren't getting like pledges from people based on that that TV spot. So I was just like, okay. So we, we were on TV. That was fun. Didn't do anything. Then maybe in June, this guy hits me up and he's just like, oh, I'm from Jambone Pictures and we're doing this wrestling documentary um, and we'd love to do a comic book version with you. So without even watching it, I'm like, yes. Then I watch it and it's so like, it's so gritty. It's so, um, it, it's got like Quentin Tarantino, like Kevin Smith, like original clerks, like B movie vibes with like a movie feels like it's a really freaking cool story about, uh, a guy that like goes up and down the roads as an indie wrestler and then kind of like discovers himself and discovers this like gimmick as a transgender performer and it's really different and um they contacted like they contacted me and then i had gone to my co-owner and was like watch this what do you think and he, he was kind of like oh i don't know i don't know i was like but we got to have a meeting with them i'm like i want to talk to these people because they're interested in working with us and even if we say no we need to have the meeting because I want to see like what they think our company is worth. I want to see like what they think of our books. Like why, why did they want to work with us? How did they find out about us? Blah, blah, blah. So within like the first five minutes of the meeting, um, Justin and John, they're the, the head honchos over at Jambone Pictures. I immediately fall in love with both of these guys. You know, John is a lawyer. He's in Amsterdam. He's got some successful startup businesses under his belt and stuff. And Justin's uh, a former professional wrestler, um, booker, and he loves pro wrestling. The conversation was awesome. We get off the Zoom call with them, and I just look at my co-owner, and I'm like, this is why you never say no, because now we have to do this book. Because I love these guys, and they have a cool story. 
and I'm like, not only do I like their story, but I think their story may be just as cool or cooler in comic book form. Because that's my whole thing. Like, I own a comic book company. So if you want to do a comic book with us, I have to ensure that the comic book isn't going to suck. So just watching the movie, it's only like 23 minutes. It's like a documentary. They're in like 19 film festivals right now. They're killing it. They're getting a lot of love. But I'm just like, this is like one of those documentaries that like maybe somebody watches the documentary and then finds out there's a comic and wants to buy the comic. Or maybe we could introduce people to the documentary by them reading the comic. I'm like, there's just so much cross pollination possible. So we ended up having another like two or three meetings with them. And uh, by the time we were done talking to them, I was the sole owner of Legacy. So that worked out great. So now we're doing that. And um, I love John and Justin are great. Like I said before, I love the both of them. They're both fantastic to work with. They're perfectionists. I'm teaching them a lot about the comic book industry um, because this is like their first comic book. Um, Joshua Adams, who did the art for Sarita is doing the art on this and he crushed it like right before the podcast I got the last of the letters and oh my god it's so nice it's so good but then what happened was um I'm having a conversation with John and it's hard to talk to John sometimes because he just had a kid and he's in Amsterdam so the time is all over the place so like we end up talking at all crazy times of the day and he was just like, oh, you know, I was just thinking, like, we need to do something, like, special for this comic. And I'm like, I already have an idea. So what happened was I reached out to Valentin Quinones, who did our first uh, variant cover for the job. And he did one for Brooklyn Bleeds. And I was just like, listen, there's a great Wolverine cover where, like, he's got the claws coming up and he's got his finger out like that. I was like, let's do an homage where we have um, Justin's character, the Nomad, in drag as Gia Savitz, that's his his girl, his female gimmick. We have him in drag, and instead of holding up claws, he's holding up lipstick, you know? And he was like, I could totally do that. And he basically banged out this cover in like three days, and I sent it to John and Justin, and they were like, holy, and they, they were like, holy shit. They're like, this cover is awesome. And I was like, this cover is awesome for a variety of reasons. One, because people are just gonna wanna buy it because of the Wolverine homage. And I did not foresee Wolverine coming back and being this big thing again with Deadpool. But, like, I'm happy that we did the homage when we did it. That was just having my finger on the pulse. Totally lucky. But then I don't believe luck exists anyway. But um, then, but then we give Valentin another opportunity to shine as a variant cover artist. Um, Valentin, I also got him a gig doing 2D art for uh, BPM Boy with um, Tony Barnes on the Atari VCS, so Tony Barnes has like 36 years of video game experience, so like Desert Strike, Jungle Strike, Urban Strike, Soviet Strike, NHL, Madden, Buffy, um, Star Wars Episode 3, like he's been a Strider, Medal of Honor, so like Valentin's a big video game fan, so like I got Valentin on that, on that game, so it's just like whenever I need to call on him, he does amazing work, so um, Ballad of Frankie and Gia is only an eight-page ash can, but it's a really cool ash can. It really sets the scene for the documentary, and it's got a sexy variant cover. So it's just like, what what more can you ask for, you know? So I feel like Dracula set the bar really high for us for how we work with licenses, and the fact that like Bram Stoker's family went on Facebook and said that they thought Bram Stoker would be happy with our version. That was super important to me. So whenever we do a work with a license, I want to just make sure that they are completely, utterly happy with the work. And I think so far we've pretty much nailed it with Jambone. So the thing is, if you like wrestling, um, you'll love the job. Um, but you'll also love the Ballad of Gia and Frankie. There's some twists and turns in there that I don't think a lot of people will see coming. Like the way it ends is super freaking cool. Like I'm, I'm super excited for that. So that's going to be a lot of fun. And I am not a big wrestling person just because I just never grew up watching it. And I didn't have friends who watched it, so I didn't have a reason to get into it. I'm still excited about mm -hmm. all of these. Like, I'm definitely going to be getting them. I'm definitely going to be reading them. I'm definitely going to be throwing them at some of my friends and saying, hey, read this shit. Come on. See, that's the thing, too. Like, the job, the job is really about, like, 
Bev and Dan trying to live their best life. It's their American dream. Like they're trying to have like the the picket fence and stuff like that, and they have to wreck like they want to wrestle, but they have to rob banks in order to to support their dream. And then like um, the Ballad and Gia and Frankie, I feel like anyone can connect with that because like it's very rare that like somebody projects themselves to be like what they are because to, to many people like perception is everything so people will project the way they want to come off to people not the way that they actually are people don't like to project weakness they like to project strength so the ballad of g and frankie is just about a guy that was trying to become a professional wrestler and was trying to be the wrestler that everyone wanted him to be and it wasn't until he like really came in touch with with a side of his a side of himself that he had not shown everyone that he became as successful as he wanted to be so it's just like i feel like if you take the wrestling out and you just look at it look at look at it as a modern day coming of age tale that just happens to be about wrestling then you'll dig it too so i'm excited but do you know what else makes me excited what makes you excited this scene stupid birds get what's coming to them <laughs> there's a great story behind this so um the company officially like kind of transferred to me probably like two or three days after my birthday um the series of events that led to me becoming sole owner of Legacy happened like right before my birthday. Um, and I was just tired and a little stressed out. And my wife surprised me with like a one day, like one night trip to Atlantic City. My sister-in-law came over and she watched both of our kids. And um, I got one day away with my wife. I haven't gotten one day away with my wife in like six years. So we gambled and we ate and we had fun and it was so like cathartic to, and especially coming back knowing that I was going to fill out the rest of this paperwork and, and take over the company. It just amazing, amazing experience. But what happened was we had been out like the night before and then the next morning we were getting ready to leave to go back home, to go back to normality. And my wife was like, let's get breakfast and sit out like by the beach. So I'm like, okay. So if you've ever been to Atlantic City before, like everything is super expensive. So, but I, I basically got like an $11 like bacon, egg and cheese, but it looked amazing. Like the egg juice and the cheese and like the bacon was all like just being absorbed by this really scrumptious like roll or bagel. I don't even remember what it was. It was a bagel. It was an everything bagel. I'm sorry. So the bagel was like all soggy. I was I was hyped. I was ready to eat this bagel. So we're sitting on the boardwalk in Atlantic City. And this bird just like comes over to me, this seagull. And he's just like, ah, oh, ah. Oh. And I'm like, this. I'm, I felt like he was talking to me. And he was basically like, bitch, give me the bagel. And I just like kind of shoot him away. And he flew to like the other side of the boardwalk. But he's still looking at me. <laughs> and he walks back. And I'm watching him, and he's just like, oh, oh, and it's just like he's repeating himself. So then I just take off a little piece of the bagel and I chuck it, and he goes and he eats it, and then he just this bird goes berserk. He's like, ah, oh, ah, oh, ah, oh, oh. and I'm like, oh, fuck, and I knew what was happening. He was calling his friends, and within like two minutes, there's like thirty of these birds like near my feet. And my wife is like, we need to get inside, like, right now. So my wife still had all of her food, like, covered because she's laughing at this. Because I'm just watching these birds, and she's laughing. So now we basically have to, like, kind of run across the street to get back inside the casino. As we're running, a bird swoops down and takes the bagel right out of my hands. Flies up into the air. Starts eating it. The bagel is like falling apart and birds are eating the bagel in midair. I don't think any part of that bagel hit the floor. And I was so pissed. I was like, and, and they, they, they are the exact birds that are in them goals. Like they're these seagulls that have black faces, but like white bodies. And they're kind of like diesel. They're bigger than average seagulls. And they got like really big wingspans because like one of them, like totally like bitch slapped my wife with this like 
wing, he just like he came down like ah, and like just like clotheslined my wife with his claw. So like we get back into the casino, and my wife is dying. She she's like it's the funniest thing in the world, and I'm pissed because I just like lost like an eleven dollar sandwich and I was starving. So then I go in the legacy lab, the little group on Facebook that we have, and um, I'm just saying like this fucking bird just ate like my sandwich within like five minutes joshua adams is drawing pictures of seagulls eating sandwiches in like this cartoony style and then everyone's like joking around and being like oh it could be they could be like the mafia of the boardwalk and blah 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 and then by the time i got home when the kids went to bed that night i wrote like the ash can script and it's basically like it's Dem Goals Birdwalk Empire, and it's basically like four seagulls that run the Jersey Shore, and they've all got four distinct personalities, and they're they're completely insane because these birds are complete. The birds on Atlantic on Atlantic City Boardwalk are completely insane. There's like there's something wrong with these birds, you know. So um, it's totally reminiscent of like Good Feathers from like Animaniacs mixed in with some adult swim definitely like some aqua teen hunger force definitely some beavis and butthead um it's totally off the wall and i'm like super worried because it's like the cartoony style like some little kid at a at a con will be like oh i want that one and i'm gonna be like no no because like it's foul mouthed it's off the wall it's silly it's a really fun ash can and um it's something that like we're definitely going to continue um we, we obviously want to see how it does first, but, like, we already have, like, Josh already, Josh wants me, you mind if I, like, write, like, a script for, like, issue one? And I'm like, yeah, man, go ahead, do it. Like, you know, and I'm like, I'll, I'll chime in, I'll edit with you. If I feel like I wrote enough, then we'll share writing credit. But if not, then, then it's yours, you know, like, so it's just, uh, it's really fun, silly. We wanted to have a silly book, to be honest, because you look at Night Owl and it's very noir and very serious. Um, Condry, super noir, super serious. Um, the job has some lighthearted moments, but it's bank robbery and stuff and wrestling. This is just completely undeniably silly and stupid, but it's so much fun at the same time. And I love the art. So you were trying to not pigeonhole yourself. <laughs> I see what you did there. I like that. See, this is why we get along. This is why you're so good. You know, um, definitely not trying to pigeonhole myself. Absolutely, absolutely positively. So the thing is, those are our five books for the full. But there should have been a sixth, and there still may be a sixth. So, what I can tell you is that Young Condry was supposed to come out in the full. And it is the end of the origin story of Condry. So it's just like if you read like the official reading order is like Condry 0, Sarita, Condry 1, 2, 3 and 4. So like I wanted the rest of Condry's backstory following Condry 4 to be filled in completely by the time we got to Condry 5 and that would be like the first arc. Um, I had gotten an amazing artist that's done work for Image. He's done tons and tons of indie stuff too his name's nick alcorn he's out of buffalo did ain't no grieve super talented guy we signed him to a contract in january um and then like as of like may or june he was still still on point he had sent me like eight pages of pencils um and then i don't know what happened you know like silent quitting is kind of like a thing now um just stopped answering messages um it's one of the best scripts i've ever written and i say that a lot but it's just like i feel like brooklyn bleeds sarita young Condry. like if i never write another comic if those are the only three comics that people read i'm totally fine with that like and um nick had done some amazing pencils and his character designs are off the hook good and then it's just like that it's not it's not gonna happen but luckily um and we're going to announce this on the site on um, Friday that um, we've hired a new artist to do Young Condry. His name's Chris Booth. 
super talented guy and young Condry is going to be coming out in the winter so for our winter run so right now we're a seasonal company so we print we publish four times a year winter spring summer and fall for now eventually the next step would be bi-monthly and then the dream obviously would be monthly but like unlike some other comic book companies that i've worked for and some other comic book companies that i know we haven't lost money in our first year everyone's been paid i have not bounced one check our website has never been shut down for not being paid um i prefer the slow organic build um having young Condry in the fall would have been great it would have increased our production cost significantly but um we would have been able to pull it off but it just works out good because with these five books i feel like these five books are strong enough and if we can move young Condry to the winter then that that begins to make like young Condry the foundation of the winter instead of it it also would take something away from night owl brooklyn bleeds and the job which i didn't want to do either you know so it worked out that was the best thing that could have happened so young Condry, new artist coming out in the winter the other book that i'm not going to say too much about but if you're a legacy comics book if you're a legacy comics fan you're going to know what i'm talking about even though i'm not going to say what i'm talking about um there's one book that um I'm trying to say this the right way chris has a ton of breakout potential got a super cool lead character um it's based on excellent source material and it was a part of our kickstarter and the art just wasn't there and it really hurt the book so what i did was i went out and i got an unknown artist um across the world super talented young kid that redid this book the way that it deserves to be done um if it's finished in time it'll be out in the full it'll be digital only digital only and trading card however anyone that had that bought the original version on our kickstarter um or on our site or at a signing if you send me a picture of you holding this comic i will send you a digital version of this comic for free of the new version because I feel like um, customer support is super important. And uh, absolutely, absolutely, Chris. I'm happy this isn't a video podcast, but um, Chris knows. So my whole thing is it's just like, I feel like all of the other books that have my name on it from that Kickstarter, I deliver to a certain standard, whether it be the art, the storytelling. And I feel like that book wasn't where it needed to be so i felt like the least that i could do for the people that had invested in that is give them something that is more along the lines of what that property deserved so it's almost done i don't want to rush my creator he's uh he's younger he's super young super talented i'm definitely like nurturing him along the way he's under the learning tree and stuff like that but um i'll show you some stuff chris after and you're gonna go mm-hmm um so i'm super excited for that 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 probably won't be announced for a couple of weeks um if it comes out in the fall if not then it will be young conjury and that property for the winter and maybe we'll throw in like another ash can or two so we'll have like or maybe another dem goals so winter will be a lot of fun but full we're coming out like super hard swinging three full page book three full 24 page books some sexy digital ash cans the trading cards it's gonna be a lot of fun i'm super excited my whole goal like this fall was to kind of like just like rectify some of the some of the mistakes that were made in the company um to increase fan um confidence reader confidence um and to like establish us as the type of company that listens to their readers because I had gotten easily 15 emails from people that were like, 
the story on this book is really cool. It's like throwback 80s video game style, but like the art's not doing it for me. And I'm gonna be brutally honest, that hurt. Because I'm not responsible for that. But I am responsible at the same time. And I will tell you guys without giving away too much information that like that book went through two or three different versions. Like six pages of art were done and it's like, nope, do it again. And then again, nope, do it again. And then lastly, the last time it's like, we're out of time. People paid for it on the Kickstarter. Got to give them something. This is the best that what we have. And you've got to make your deadline and you've got to give people like a product. But um, it's a lesson learned. Um, and I just feel like I tell all of my artists now, because it, again, this was a lesson learned. I tell all of my artists now that like, if you just want to get published, you're working for the wrong company. If you don't want to have your book reviewed by comic book resources, by bloody disgusting, by play comics, by whatever, whatever pipe dream comics, whatever website that's out there that reviews comics. If you don't want them to be reviewed, then why are we doing this? You know? And it's just like, that was a book where it was like the artist on the book didn't want it to be reviewed. Like I was pitching review websites and it's like, oh yeah, show them the job, show them Condry, show them this, but don't show them this and don't show them that. And I'm just like, what are we doing this for? You're just costing us money. So the feel I, my thought is like, we kill two birds with one stone. We got a lot stronger uh, this summer by promoting Afram Jambalai to senior editor was super important. You know, because now this was a thing too. Um, as editor in chief of the public of uh, the imprint, I didn't really have anyone reading my stuff. I was supposed to, but didn't. And um, the people responsible for like at least copy editing my stuff thought that they didn't have to. So luckily, no gaffes, no mistakes. But it's just like having someone with Afram's experience in acting in theater he knows what sounds good he knows dialogue i mean when you think about it comic books are, are like it's like theater in a way you need dy dramatic dialogue and stuff so having him read over my stuff and make suggestions and stuff that's what i want i want creating comics to be a collaborative endeavor for everyone in our team so that last book having it having that series like rectified and giving a young artist an opportunity to do it it just felt like it was the best thing for our company and my hope is to have it done for the full but like again i don't want to rush this kid i want him to do the best job that he possibly can and it's going to feel a lot different from the version that was released in our kickstarter so i'm super excited for it no i'm super excited for it i was excited just when you told me however long ago it was that you guys were going to try to do something with it and that was literally all you told me so sweet yeah yeah, it, it just had to be done. You know, it's like um, every once in a while you get an opportunity to look at a weakness and turn it into a strength. Or you look at the weakness and you forget that it existed. And it's just like we've really as a company separated ourselves from people that like don't objectively look at their mistakes. And uh, it's like perfect example, like what I said about Afram. Legend of the Night Owl Zero, that first page, I love that first page with Kieran's like cityscape. But there's a ton of text on that. Could we have cut that down a little bit? Could it have been a little bit more noir? Sure. But my whole thing, it was, it was just like, I wanted Afrim to learn, you know, and to see the progression of him as a writer from Night Owl Zero to Night Owl One. It's amazing to see. It's amazing to see how talented he is and how far he's come in such a short amount of time. It's the same way I feel like when I look at what Kieran did on Conjury Zero and now to see what he's done on Night Owl 1, oh, or to see what Steve has done from, you know, Renfield and what he's done on the job now, oh, so good. Or, again, Josh Adams, Godfo, Sarita, Demgols, and The Ballad of Gia and Frankie four different comics he's done them in like four months they all look completely different from one another the guy is literally like 
the Bruce Lee of artists that we have. He has no style as style, you know, and that's what that's what makes his series Godfo so sexy to me because it's just like they him and Dan Evans, the writer, they have like a series of graphic novels that they have planned, and I'm just like, are all of these graphic novels going to be do, done in different styles? And he's like, yeah, and I'm just like, yeah, man, like rock star, total rock star. So I'm beyond excited for the next couple of weeks. It's going to be a lot of long nights um, laying out these books. Um, go, I've been going over letters with Josh for like a week. I feel so bad. This guy's working his, he's literally working his butt off. Carl uh, has like, let's say the fifth. He's got like another like 10 days to work on Brooklyn Bleeds. He's killing it. And we got, you know, the other book that's on deadline. It's an exciting time for us. We've got uh, another signing on October 15th at Infinite Collectibles. Then we've got another signing at, at Lo, uh, Locali in Staten Island Mall um, on October 29th for Halloween. So, I mean, we're doing really good. Afrim is speaking at the Helen Keller Foundation. Like, <laughs> this guy's super talented. Like, Afrim is in the David Lynch screenwriting master's program. Like, if that doesn't tell you that this guy has some chops, you know? So I'm just super excited for like the future. These five or six books are gonna be really cool. And then like whatever we don't get to, the winter is gonna be really cool. And then we got digital books, we got physical books, we got the trading cards are gonna be really cool. So I'm super excited for the full. Well then I guess I need to step up my game and get my thing written. Yes, absolutely. And see, this is the thing too, it's just like, um, if anyone's listening to me that sent me a script over the past like three months, I literally have like 62 scripts in my inbox right now. And I'm going to tell you guys, um, most of them are not bad at all. But the thing is, it's just like we are, for the most part, a publisher and not a studio. A studio will take your script and find you an artist and blah, blah 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 and it's just like at this point like we don't really like have the resources to do that for every single person that submits a script however if i read a script and i am like floored then i will go okay let's do something or i'll say okay let's do something it's not going to have as big a print run as maybe some of our other stuff but like let's give it a chance let's see how it resonates with people We'll do a digital version. We'll do like a smaller print run or whatever. But it's just like, I tell people all the time, I wrote Condry like 21 years ago. I just published it in like February of 2021. If I didn't have that like 18, 19 years of going through like four or five other artists, um, growing as a writer, living, experiencing things, this comic book series, The Job, Kroom, Legacy Comics, none of that stuff ever exists. So it's just like, if you've written a script and you really care about it and you really want to get it published, you'll find an artist by yourself. And then you pitch me what you have. You show me six to eight pages of sequential art, like a clear, like issue zero ash can. And then that's how a publisher will go, okay, this person really wants it. Let's invest in them. Let's give them a print run. Let's give them trading cards. Let's make merch for them, you know? Um, Cause that's what happened with Godfo. Like Dan Evans and Joshua Adams came to us and they were like, yeah, we have a ton of stuff. And I'm just like, okay, before we do like a graphic novel with you or whatever and stuff, because Josh is amazing. Dan is like mega intelligent. We're like let's see how an ash can does first give us six to eight pages and within like two weeks they turned out like a six to eight page they turned out an eight page story you know and it looked awesome and it's got a killer cover they proved to me that they wanted to do business you know so that's why like josh has worked on like four or five of our other comics since then and i've told dan before that like you know if the opportunity arises that we need another writer um I would love that. I would love to have him do something, but they showed me and they showed everyone else how much they wanted it. It's so easy for like, especially a writer 
to be like, oh, I wrote a script, find me an artist. And it's just like, I feel like a lot of writers have problems like marketing themselves and selling themselves and networking. Because the thing is, you could be the best writer in the world, but if you can't speak to somebody, if you can't market yourself, you know? So it's just like for me, like with Carl, I didn't know Carl from a hole in the wall. And I messaged him and I spoke to him like a real human being. And I was just like, listen, um, Chris Osborne told me to contact you. He's a rock star. I love Chris. I've been on his podcast a bunch of times. I'm doing a book like this zombie book, da 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 da. And I, I told him what I could offer him in terms of pay. I was like, this is what I can offer you. If you can't do it, it's fine. But I really love your stuff. I think we could do something really cool. He asked me some questions. We went back and forth over a couple of days. He read the script. He comes back to me. Like, that's what you have to do. You have to, like, show people how much this stuff means to you. You know? So it's like anyone can pump out, like, a six to eight page comic book script. But are you going to, like, be willing to, like, put yourself out on a line, put your heart out on a string and talk to an artist and be like, I really want to work with you. What do I have to do to make this happen? A lot of writers think that that's like a publisher or a studio's job. And at the end of the day, it's not, it's yours. You know, there are, like I said, rare situations where that's different. But for the most part, most people, they're just gonna have a script that sits in an email box because it's like, if you're not fighting for your IP, if you're not showing people like what you're willing to do, why are they gonna, you know, why are they gonna willing, why are they gonna be willing to invest in you, you know? So, and then especially now we've got Kickstarter, we've got pre-orders and stuff like that. I tell people all the time, if you put out a book and you can't get like at least a hundred pre-orders, probably shouldn't publish the book, you know? Like if you can't sell like a hundred copies before the book comes out, why are we doing this? Cause it's hard, you know, it's freaking hard. So are you willing, I, I'll, I'll tell, this goes out to every writer, every artist that thinks that they want to do a book. Are you willing to do two or three podcasts a week for six months? for people to find out about your character. Are you willing to post on social media five to 10 times a day about your product? Like most of them think, well, I wrote it and now you gotta sell it, you know? So it's it's hard and I'm lucky that like the people that I have have kind of absorbed some of that stuff. So like Steve Conjay and Afram and Josh and Dan, like they get that they have to do a lot of marketing themselves. That even though like we're publishing them, that they have to they have to be the face of their property. So that's been like some of this that was some of the struggle before before the summer that we had that like people thought that it was like my job to like sell their book for them. And it's like at the end of the day, it's like, no, if if we invest in you and publish your book, then you gotta like not repay the investment because that sounds super mafioso, right? You gotta repay the investment. But it's like, if we spend a couple of thousand dollars to publish one of your books and it sells 50 copies, you're not making money and we lost money. So who wants to, who wants to deal with that, you know? So, but yeah, we kind of went a little granular and got off the rails there. But like, that's for all those people that are interested in like getting into the comic book industry. It's like, you got to spend a couple of hours a day building a social media presence. And like, I would even suggest to some people build the social media presence, have people like you for you first, then you, then you throw your art at them, you know, just a thought. No, here's what you do. You start a podcast, you get a bunch of people on it so they can promote their stuff and you pick their brains slowly mm -hmm. over time. And then you be friends with a bunch of artists and you get like three to five of them who say, hey, when you get the script done, let's see what my schedule looks like. And that's mm -hmm. totally not happening for me at all. No, I don't know what you're talking about. That's a good idea, though. I hope that you do that. That would be refreshing if you did that. I would like to see the end result of such an endeavor. I have a couple days off. The script is going to be knocked out. There you go. That's what it's about, man. You know, it's just like I tell people all the time. It's like, if you want to do something, just do it, you know? And it's like, um, everything is interconnected in one way or another, you know? So just like perfect example, like your podcast, it's, it's about video games and it's about comics, but, and 
tell people all the time, like, when you put video games in a place where there's only comics, video games become instantly sexy and you can sell video games to comic book fans. And then if you put comic books in a place where there's only video games, same exact thing happens. People go, oh, there's a lot of video games here. Oh, sh oh, 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 there's comics here. What's that? Oh, that's cool. So just like, if you create a situation where you're like playing off of all of your fandom and you're just having fun and you're creating situations where like, it's not cliche and people have to think about your products and they, they have a, a reason to feel something about your product, you're going to sell, you know? But it's just like most people give up before they even, and this was, this was probably, this was one of the things I really wanted to talk about today where it's just like, I felt like so many people thought that like after our Kickstarter got funded, that the work was over and they expressed how tired they were of seeing me post three or four times a day and pushing the product. And I told them, I'm like, no, now that we got the money from the Kickstarter, now this is when the company really begins. So if you're tired now, we're screwed. I'm like, cause I'm not tired. I'm like, I knew that this was a marathon. And then that's the thing. It's just like, once the Kickstarter's book, once the Kickstarter book books uh, came out, everyone was kind of like, ah. and I'm like, no, because now we got to put out the next batch of books because there's so many comic book companies out there that have successful Kickstarters that never release any books. So we just defied the odds and we actually like release books. So now what we have to do is now we have to release the next batch of books. And then once the summer books came out, people were like, oh, what's next? And I'm like, the fall. And they're like, oh my God, this is going to be like, I'm like, yes, this is like Lamb Chops Play Along. This is the song that doesn't end, you know? It goes on and on, my friend. Like, we have stories to tell. We have people to reach. And I said to them, too, it's like, I joke around with people when we're at signings. Like, you know, if we have, like, Steve or Afrin with us, Condry usually does really well. And the reason why Condry does well is because we have zero, one, two, three, four, and Sarita all there. So I can pitch the entire first arc to people, and people will end up leaving, buying all five comics. So the thing is, I go to Afrin, like, dude, you have a killer story. Once we get issue one, issue two, issue three, what do you think is going to happen when we do a signing? People are going to do the same exact thing. Or we get to issue three, issue four, we sell out of all the single issues. Omni, graphic novel, trade paperback, you know? So it's just like, you have to stay in it, you know? And so many people are just like... They just want to release something just to say that they did. And those people are, those people have the wrong mindset. Like when you're pitching an ash can to somebody, you should be like, you know what? Yes, this is the script, but I'm ready for like, I'm ready to go. I have the first arc all planned out, blah, 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 blah. Like it's just a nonstop grind. It's like a 45 minute spin class. And then as soon as it's finished, you just finish your drink and you do another 45 minutes. And most people will die for that second class. But the people that finish the second class those are the people that should work in the comic book industry because that's what it's like i feel like like lamb chop we're gonna need to cut things off or we'll go on and on forever um i can't ask you the mm -hmm. muppet question because we already know you love fozzy so we'll be a mm -hmm. little more timely right now i don't know where your loyalties yeah, lie so we're about to find out where do you think aaron judge ends up home run total I don't think he hits another one. I think he's got at least one more he'll just walk into because he's like eight feet tall. Yeah, that's true. It's funny, too, with the whole Dusty Baker stuff that's been going on. Like, Dusty Baker is like, oh, you know, not my not my home run champ, blah, blah, blah. But it's just like in today's in today's era, getting to 30 is a lot easier than it used to be. Like when we were kids. Like when we were kids in the late 80s, early 90s, if you hit 25 home runs, you were considered like a power hitter, you know? And now it's like, if you hit 25, it's like, yeah, whatever. And if you hit 30, it's like you're a power hitter, but eh. so like so many more people are hitting 40 and 50 home runs, but to get to 60, he's a rock star. And it's like, I'm a Mets fan, but man, that guy is something special. And he strikes out a ton, a ton. And he still hit over 300. He's a beast. 
He's hitting like what 315 now? Somewhere right in there. It's amazing. His on base is sick. His slugging percentage is sick. Like, yeah, man. He's a lot of fun to watch. So, yeah, I don't think he hits another one. Oh, he will. I think so. But, Patrick, it has been great talking to you about all of this. If people want to hear more from you, where else can they find you around the internet? Uh, You can go to legacycomics.com and C O M I X. Um, We are on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, legacy underscore comics. Um, I'm on Instagram at Patrick Hickey Jr. I'm on Facebook at Patrick Hickey Jr. and fully Googleable. Um, our website is updated daily with work in progress. We have a really sexy shop. We've got merch. Um, we try and interact with people as often as possible. Our social media is updated anywhere from like five to six times a day. We really love interacting with our fans. If you buy something from us, it's usually shipped the same day. All our comics are shipped and in Gemini boxes, bagged and boarded. Um, a lot of the times I just sign comics that are bought just to be nice because it's just like if you're going to order comics digitally, from, uh, if you're going to order comics from us from our website, it's just like it's the least that we could do is give you guys some extra incentive and stuff. We usually sneak some goodies in your boxes too. So yeah, that's where you can find us, LegacyComics.com. And just like always... We'll have links to all that stuff down in the description because remembering whether it's X or CS is stupid. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. X is obviously cooler. We both agree on that because we're in the proper age bracket for X to be cool. I don't want to think yes, about what that number absolutely. means. Yeah. <laughs> we're old. As always, if you want to hear more from me, head on over to playcomics.com where there's links to all the social media stuff, including Discord and Twitter and all the other fun stuff where you can just kind of hang out with me and get hints on this thing that I'm writing that some people have actually seen because, yes, it does exist in a sort of tangible way in the real world, you know, as tangible as anything digital ever is. If you want to help support the show, then number one, tell me you want to read my thing because, yes you do but also you can head on over to playcomics.com slash support where you can sign up for patreon or give me money through kofi or really just take the show and shove it into somebody's ear holes probably somebody that knows it's coming is going to be a little bit of an easier job for you it's not really a good surprise to have things magically appear in your ears Please don't forget that Play Comics is a part of the GunnaGeek.com network, home to such wonderful shows as Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D., where you can hear me talk about S.H.I.E.L.D. and maybe in this latest episode, how I'm a little bit worried how they're going to stick the landing. If you like the music that I'm rudely talking on top of right now, head on over to SoundCloud.com slash Best Dash Day to check out Best Day's music. But most of all, just grab a game, grab a stack of comics, and go find yourself a new favorite character. 